At number 10, we have Phage. So he is a symbiote that can constitute matter manipulation. That's a mouthful, don't try to say it 10 times fast, I don't think it's possible. But this means that he can form his symbiotic costume into long, serrated blades and then slash or stab at his opponents. He also has the ability to possess his brother Carnage. So you can imagine, Carnage is very powerful, so to take over him, Man, it's difficult to take this guy down. At number 9, we have Lasher. So he came into existence when Venom was kidnapped and forcibly extracted five seeds from him to make these superhumans at the Life Foundation, super corrupt, evil place. He has a very different look than a lot of the others because he has these tentacles coming out of his back that he uses in battle to lash out at his opponents. At number 8 is Agony. So a former mercenary is now one of the five individuals who volunteered to become a superhuman for, again, that corrupt Life Lab Foundation. She has sharp claws and teeth, but what makes her the most foreboding are her abilities centered around acid generation. Mainly that she can spit an acid that would burn through almost anything. Oof, I feel like my joke was too dirty, so I'm gonna leave it. <laughs> Number seven is Scream. She was another one of these people who came from Venom Seeds at the Life Foundation. She seems to have superior skills to the rest of them, so she quickly became their leader. So that always makes me feel like you're the most evil also. Her unique power is that she can use her hair as a weapon. Ah, oh, watch out, boys. <laughs> But seriously, this means she can like wrap it around people to hold them in place. She can also use it offensively. It's also later revealed that her host was clinically insane and she ends up murdering all of her fellow Life Foundation symbiotes one by one. Dark twist. ZZZXX, I know, great name, comes up at number six. He is said to be one of the five most dangerous criminals in the galaxy from the Shi'ar Empire. His big difference is that he feeds off the brains of his host exclusively. Like he's basically like a zombie symbiote, almost. Others have definitely shown desire to do this, but he is doing it all the time. He's just like, oh yeah, brains, give them to me, that's what I want super scary, creepy, and evil. At number five, we have Riot. Said to be by far the most violent of the Guardian symbiotes the Life Foundation created, Riot was trained in a ton of hand-to-hand -hand combat, firearms, and combat tactics in general. However, he really embraced his dark side instead with a love for blunt force instruments and just bludgeoning his enemies to death. Number four is Crone Storm. This guy's host was already bad news before he met the symbiote. He went into business with his evil father, he helped kill the Punisher's family. Once he became a host, he became even more evil evil with poisonous saliva, poisonous blood, that's right, like alien, and the ability to transform his host's molecular structure in order to be a more adaptable liquid, aka able to shapeshift a lot more easily. At number three, this has to be one that popped into my mind immediately. I think a lot of people think of this guy, Carnage. He's one of the most famous symbiotes, to be sure. Carnage and his host, Cassidy, have a stronger bond than Brock and Venom. I guess they just have a bit more in common, since Cassidy is also an insane serial killer and one of the most vile human beings on the planet. Thus, Carnage is far more powerful, violent, and deadlier than Venom is. In number two, we have Toxin. Carnage is his father. Venom was his surrogate caregiver. So right there, we see what he comes from. He had the good or evil genetics from his father, and then a really powerful symbiote like Venom sort of training him and taking care of him. Toxin proved that he is just so much more powerful than Carnage and Venom that they actually had to team up together in order to take him out with the help of Spider-Man. So it took three people to take him down. At number one, we just had to put this here, are the poisons. So some of you may not know about these guys, but they're actually said to be more powerful than not only Venom, but the symbiotes in general, as they are the species' natural predator. They are so powerful that Thanos himself was their leader. Not only do the poisons take on the powers of their hosts like others, they can also transform their host into weapons and interdimensionally travel. Number 10, alternate versions. There are a few different versions of She Venom, including Anne Wang and Patricia Robertson, who is portrayed by Michelle Williams in the new Venom movie, just to name a few. Anne first appears in The Amazing Spider-Man number 375 way back in 1993. She also makes two more appearances, first with the cameo in Venom Sinner Takes All number two, and having her first full appearance in Venom Sinner Takes All number three. Patricia Robertson not only appears in the movie, but in the comic book Venom number one, and she 
returns as she venom in venom number 10. Being that there are more than one she venom, I'll make sure to mention which character I'm talking about before delivering the info. Number 9, a Spider-Man alliance. Early on in her appearances, Anne was frightened of Venom, but being his ex-wife meant she knew a lot about him. And in trying to prevent her ex-husband from a tyrannical rampage, she gave Spider-Man stories, information, and history about Brock. She even so boldly confronted her psychotic former husband when she followed Spider-Man to an amusement park where Venom had lured Peter with hopes of saving his parents. She then managed to convince Eddie to give up this horrible vendetta against Spider-Man. Good job, Anne. Number 8, Venom Soft Spot. In Anne's first cameo in the comic book, Venom Sinner takes all number two, she's held at gunpoint by Sin Eater, who threatens her life after saying, if my thumb should slip off this dead man's switch, 20 pounds of plastic explosives will send us all to eternity. And Venom pleads with Sin Eater that Anne is an innocent and to let her go. When Sin Eater refuses to listen, he fires off a shot from his gun, which Venom dives in front of to block. I found this kind of heartwarming, you know, because Venom rarely cares about innocence. We even see him divide from the suit later on and order the symbiote to fuse with Anne to bring her back to life, thus creating the Bride of Venom. Number 7, 1602. We have yet another version of Anne and Venom that comes to us from 1602, Witch Hunter Angela Number 2. In this time period, she is known as the Village Beauty and is charmed by one Edwin Brock, although B-R-O-C-C, -C. and he is attacked by the Witch Hunter when she sees that he's possessed by Venom. Edwin is doing some slimy stuff here in the comic book by giving Anne a drink that seemingly makes her fall in love with him. Number Six, Spider Gwen, or as we'll be discovering, Gwenum, makes her first appearance in Spider Gwen Volume 2, Number 24. The Gwenum arc came out of a beloved series of Spider Gwen, and the creation of the name is just hilarious. The artist Robbie Rodriguez told Newsarama, in the tradition of Spider Gwen, we just made another book out of a pun we came up with in a bar. Spider Gwen becomes Gwenum when she used a device that emits a sound wave used in an attempt to remove the symbiote from a newly infected Wolverine. However, without a host, the sound wave has no effect and binds to Spider Gwen, taking over her, giving us the birth of Gwenum. And she looks so badass. I mean, just look. Number five, video games. Yes, that's right. She Venom has made appearances in the video game Spider Man Unlimited. In this game, sometime after becoming Spider Woman, Gwen Stacy is recruited by Shield to defeat a team of sinister Sixers from across the multiverse. In her first appearance of Gwenum in Edge of Spider Verse number two, her best friend Harry Osborne. Osborn is infected with the lizard virus. To top it all off, she has her new spider powers forcibly removed, leaving her with one option, to turn to Earth-65, Kingpin of Crime. This Kingpin is seen with his own experimental version of the symbiote that Gwen sees as the answer to her problems. Number four, high school student. Annie Benton, who wasn't one of the characters I mentioned in the number 10 spot, was a high school student who attended West Philadelphia High School. She became friends with her new neighbor, Flash Thompson, who was also an assistant coach at her school and in possession of the Venom symbiote. After she was the target of Jack-o-lantern because of this friendship, Thompson used the symbiote in an effort to save Andy. However, the symbiote suit ended up intertwining with Benton, transforming her into mania. Number three, communications specialist. Patricia Robertson is a 24-year-old communication specialist and lieutenant for the US Army, who was actively stationed at a radar station in Canada. This town in which she was stationed was called Christmas Town and was located just above the Arctic Circle. On her way to deliver an air into a laboratory nearby that was owned by the Ararat Corporation, she found that all of these scientists had been massacred. This lab had been trying to study Venom symbiotes and their clones when everything went south and the clone escaped, killing everyone. Well, except for a single survivor, that is. And unknowingly, Patricia carried the symbiote back to her original post in Christmastown, where it began again, killing everyone except for her. Number two, Miss Marvenom. Uh, okay, I made that name up, but did you? Did you know that even Miss Marvel has been bonded with the Venom suit in the past? Originally, the suit was bonded to the evil Gargan, who used it to cannibalize as guardians. And when Spider Man and Miss Marvel showed up to stop him, her powers ripped the suit off, thus causing the symbiote to jump ship to Miss Marvel. This She Venom is probably the most dangerous due to the fact that it possessed both her powers and that of the Venom suit. However, it didn't last long when Miss Marvel managed to trick the symbiote and blast the alien off fur while it was. Was then reunited with Gargan. 
Number 1. Hardcore Fans When Spider-Gwen first turned into Gwenum, it became the beginning of just a giant series arc that fans fell in love with and this new character. We have seen some amazing fan art from lovers of She-Venom and even a fan trailer that was made. It looks so legit too. Here's a quick clip. Roll it. Bro. In this fan-made teaser, we see another alternate possibility for She-Venom. Perhaps she could be Eddie's daughter or a close relative. Either way, if, if you want to see the full video, we'll make sure to put it down in the description there. But remember, it is a fan trailer. Starting us off in at number 10, The Hulk. Generally speaking, anytime The Hulk is given some sort of advantage in combat beyond what he's already capable of doing, it's pretty darn dangerous. So now imagine what our green pal was capable of when Venom decided to bond with him. Yikes. But thanks to one of Marvel's What If titles, we know exactly what would happen if Venom bonded with the Hulk. Now in What If Volume 2, Issue 4, there was a story called What If the Alien Costume Had Possessed Spider-Man. This was back in October of 1989, a year after Venom and Eddie Brock had hit the scene. So the readers knew what the symbiote was capable of now. More on that later though. So the concept for this explored what if Spider-Man waited longer before going to Mr. Fantastic who ultimately separated him from the symbiote. In the story, Peter had been irreversibly bonded with Venom, and would later stumble upon the Hulk, who was on a rampage. The symbiote was like, ooh, I want to join with him, and jump ship, bonding with the Hulk instead, who the symbiote promised to help, saying that he could aid Bruce Banner with his uncontrollable hulking out problems. But the symbiote would later give up on that loose promise and ditch the Hulk for another character that he deemed more powerful, who appears a little bit later on on our list. Next up at number 9, Galactus. Now, technically speaking, Galactus doesn't really count as a character who's bonded with the symbiote. But to Spider-Man, it appears as if the god was Venom's host. Galactus Venom appears in a story in which Mysterio has completely messed with Peter Parker's head, and Peter sees Galactus donning the Venom symbiote. While it has no actual story impact aside from being a really cool splash page, it's still pretty neat to ponder what on earth, or rather in the galaxy, Venom would do if he were ever to bond with an entity that powerful. I'd take it Peter really didn't want to find out. In our number 8 spot, Norman Osborn. Twice, actually. Norman Osborn has bonded twice with the Venom symbiote in alternate timelines. Now, Once was featured in one of the many universes in the Spider-Verse stories. In this one, Norman Osborn had become the US president. And in an unprecedented move, he created something called the Variable Engagement Neurosensitive Organic Mesh, which is basically an altered version of the symbiote, something that he and his followers could wear in order to clean up America. And yes, he was totally a fascist. He even said the words, I quote, It had to be this way, Spider-Man. We're in the business of making America great again. Yup. The second time was a little less political and occurred in the MC2 universe. Enter Normie Osborn, the son of Harry Osborn who, thanks to Spider-Girl, went from being a baddie to trying to be a good guy. But then the Venom symbiote finds him, bonds with him, and Normie actually ends up reforming it, with the symbiote sacrificing itself later on down the line to help Spider-Girl fight the Hobgoblin. Not all Osborns are bad after all. Up next, number 7, Thor. Remember that what if issue we were talking about earlier? The one in which the Hulk bonds with Venom? Well, the character that the symbiote ditches Hulk 4 is none other than Thor. Thor would fight against the Hulk Venom, and despite winning the battle against it, the symbiote managed to creep out and bond with the God of Thunder. While Thor struggled mentally with the symbiote, it forced him to hide out in Mount Rushmore, until they were finally defeated by Black Bolt with his hypersonic voice, and inevitably destroyed by Black Hat wielding a sonic gun. Couldn't let Black Bolt have it, could she? Moving on to our number 6, Groot. During one Guardians of the Galaxy story arc, Venom, who was bonded with Flash Thompson at the time, makes an appearance, with the narrative's focus being the Clintar returning to his home planet. Venom ends up fighting against the Guardians and after breaking out of a glass jar that they had trapped him in, he bonds with Groot, resulting in the character repeatedly shouting, I am Venom. <laughs> So good. Other Guardians briefly became hosts too, including Rocket Raccoon and Drax. In our number 5 spot, Patricia Robertson. Venom's bonding with Robertson is often seen as a bit of a disaster. Now, In a story written by Daniel Way under Marvel's Tsunami imprint, there was this really, really weird 18 issue Venom story arc that happened in 2004. Essentially, it was revealed in issue 11 of this arc that there was a Venom clone, which had come to be when Venom tried to kill the thing by shoving his tongue down his throat. Yes, actually. And then the human torch burnt it off. So this burnt off piece of tongue that the thing coughed up was found by a civilian, who then tried to sell it on eBay where a man made out of nanites contacted him. This nanite man was apparently the nanites who inspired Noah's Ark, yes really, whose master plan was to wait for an alien symbiote to be on Earth so that they could use it to cause the apocalypse. Confused? Yeah. 
So it was like everybody else who read this story arc. Anywho, Nanite old dude man guy cloned the tongue, and the symbiote was let loose until an army lieutenant by the name of Patricia Robertson shows up and becomes bonded with it, becoming a she venom. And her character was pretty poorly written. Her symbiote clone ended up merging with Brock's venom, and after that, we pretty much never heard about Robertson ever again. And at number four, Deadpool. Deadpool is technically the first human host that Venom ever bonded with. This was revealed during Secret Secret Wars, when Deadpool stumbles upon the symbiote in captivity on Battleworld. He puts it on, realizes that it's alive and was interfacing with his mind, and then Venom's like, I can't really handle this very well, considering Deadpool is already insane. Deadpool then returns the symbiote moments before Spidey shows up, searching for a new costume to replace the one that he had damaged in battle. But overall, the encounter with Deadpool is a pretty comical one. This actually isn't the only time that Venom has bonded with Deadpool either. One of those other times actually happened in a what if title. Good ol' what ifs. And at number three, the Submariner. Spider Man 2099 was a character that first appeared in a preview in the Amazing Spider Man issue 365. And of course, he comes from the year 2099. He's a fellow named Miguel O'Hara who has managed to recreate Spider Man's powers. He got his own series in the Marvel 2099 comic line in 1992. In his story, he encounters a character named Roman, which is Namor spelled backwards. He's an Atlantean terrorist who would be caught by Spidey only to later escape captivity and then accidentally caused the Venom symbiote to be released. Venom bonded with the Submariner, transformed himself into a very piranha esque creature who had sharp teeth on the end of his tongue. The best part is, since that went down in the series' final issue, whatever happened to Venom Roman Submariner was just never actually resolved. He dived deep down into the ocean and escaped, never to be heard from again. In at number two, Mac Gargan. Venom once recounted his time with Mac Gargan as bad. With I quote, thoughts like poison stingers, and that it was a thrill to kill. Mac was a mean spirited venom, which Kind of makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Gargan, most known for being the man behind the villain Scorpion, bonded with the symbiote during Marvel Knights Spider Man. Working under Norman Osborn at the time, he was meant to be refitted with a new Scorpion suit when Venom popped up, and the combination was pretty ruthless. Gargan was very into being Venom, ended up working under Osborn as a Dark Avenger and a Thunderbolt, and would go around pulling off a whole lot of evil stunts, killing with zero remorse. At the time, Carnage was thought to be dead, so Gargan really stepped up to give the readers the symbiote brutality that we all know and love. Eventually, though, all good things come to an end, even for Mac. The government would remove Venom from him at the end of Dark Reign, and he would return to his Scorpion alias. And finally, in our number one spot, Spider-Man. While Deadpool may have been the first human host, Peter Parker's Spider-Man is the character that introduced the world to the Venom symbiote. But as we mentioned in our intro, there's quite the history behind how that came to be. Now, Back in 1982, Marvel received a letter from a fan in Illinois named Randy Schuler, who came up with this idea that Spider-Man should get a new costume that would later become an alien character. Editor-in-chief at the time, Jim Shooter responded to that letter. They dug the idea, and they paid Schuler a whopping $220 for the rights to the idea. Vaguely inspired by the new costume design for the new Spider Woman character at the time, they went with a black and white outfit. It wasn't until writer Tom DeFalco and artist Ron Friends came on board that it was determined that the costume was a sentient alien vulnerable to high sonic energy. Spidey puts the suit on, looking for new threads after being kidnapped by the Beyonder to his planet to fight in his secret wars. When he returns to Earth after Secret Wars, he begins to notice that the costume is acting strangely, so he gets Mr. Fantastic to help him remove it, and that's when they discover that it's actually a living organism. Mr. Fantastic keeps it in captivity in his HQ, but the symbiote breaks free, and eventually finds Eddie Brock, bonding with him and creating Venom in issue 300 of The Amazing Spider-Man, where him and Spidey would duke it out for the very first time. And at number 10, Carol Danvers. Once upon a time, Carol Danvers, aka Miss Marvel at the time, teamed up with Spider-Man to take on Mac Gargan's Venom. Mac, who we talked about on the part one of our list, was a particularly nasty Venom. Venom, and pretty violent and unhinged. So our two heroes worked together in a story penned by Brian Reed that depicted Carol easily stripping Gargan of Venom, although that didn't really work out as neatly as planned. The symbiote would then jump on Carol and make her his host, resulting in a Venom that had flames bursting out from its head and chest, and could also fly. <laughs> No thanks. Spider Man was able to resolve the issue quickly by pushing her into some power lines and knocking the symbiote off of her, which then caused it to go back to Mac to finish the fight. Perhaps the best part of this bonding, though, is when Venom initially bonded with Carol and then ran around and shouted, Miss Marvel is now my favorite superhero, which is like kind of adorable and endearing, isn't it? Oh, Venom. And at number nine, Human Torch. On Earth 20051, also known as the Marvel Adventures universe, the Venom symbiote decided to bond with Johnny Storm, aka the Human Torch. 
much. And considering Storm's powers, well, you can imagine how long that lasted for. The Marvel Adventures universe covered a storyline in which Spider Man gets the black sentient alien costume, and after the Fantastic Four remove it from his body, like they do in the original run with Spider Man before it was known as the Venom symbiote, it decides to hop onto the human torch. When it bonds with Johnny, he says, Wow, it can really read my surface thoughts. Let's see if it looks as cool after I flame on. The second he bursts into flames, the Venom symbiote immediately jumps ship. Now, in case you didn't know, the symbiotes have two primary weaknesses sonic sound waves and fire. So, yeah. Venom must have really enjoyed that little interaction. And at number 8, Red Hulk. In Venom Volume 2, Issue 13, in a story arc called Circle of Four, Thaddeus Ross bonds with Venom, and it's a little terrifying. So, for context, the story involved a demonic invasion of Earth by Blackheart, Mephisto's son, in an attempt to bring hell on Earth. It kind of worked, with Las Vegas getting much hotter than it usually does, which is saying a lot. Flash Thompson, who was Venom's host at the time, let Venom bond with Ross's Red Hulk, who proceeded to beat the pulp out of Blackheart and save the day, putting everything back in order. And and by the end of it, Venom actually jumped back to Thompson, proving to Captain America, who was overseeing all this, that Flash could control the symbiote after all. And at number 7, Kron Stone of Earth TRN 590. Kron Stone is a character from Earth 928, who is a villain and a total sadist, and the half brother of that Earth's Spider Man, Miguel O'Hara. But on this Earth, though, TRN 590, he appeared in Spider Man 2099 Volume 3, Issue 10, back in 2016. And he bonded with the Venom symbiote and became a pretty horrific and futuristic version of the villain. And he also became a member of the Sinister. Six. Now, initially, Kron was the dude who killed the Punisher's family in the year 2099, and was almost taken out entirely by Frank Castle, left to die in a sewer. This is where he encountered Venom, who had been chilling in the sewers for decades as a means of trying to evolve. He made Kron his host and exhibited a few new abilities, like an acidic touch and a body that could become fully liquid. Eventually, Kron's Venom would fight against Miguel's Spider Man. Miguel would win, and upon discovering it was his half brother beneath the symbiote, he managed to separate the two and confine Venom in his lab. Venom would later break out and then bond with Namor, who we talked about on our part 1 of this list. And at number 6, Rocket Raccoon. Speaking of the part 1 on our list, we talked a little bit about how Venom got cozy with the Guardians of the Galaxy in that video, particularly with Groot. So naturally on this list, we're returning to that odd story arc and taking a glimpse of the symbiotes bonding with another one of our favorite galactic heroes, Rocket Raccoon. And look at the rabies on him. Or maybe rabies. Completely unconfirmed whether or not that is actually rabies. But if you have to ask if something is rabies, it's probably rabies. Anywho, this occurred when Flash Thompson was Venom's host, and went up into space with the symbiote in order to help him recalibrate up on his homeworld of Clintar. The journey there clearly wasn't an easy one, and Venom escaped from containment, decided to hop onto Groot, and then after receiving a beating from Drax, jumped ship over to Sweet Little Rocket, everybody's favorite trash panda, and insisted that everyone get the hell off his ship. Rocket's tenure didn't last that long though, because Venom would then jump over to Drax instead when Drax tried to grab him from behind. Don't startle a trash panda. It'll never go well for you. And at number 5, Mercurio the 4D Man. After heading home to Clintar with the Guardians, Venom rebonded with Flash Thompson and became Agent Venom, who was inducted into the Agents of the Cosmos for a brief amount of time, traveling around the galaxy to planets that they sensed were in trouble, being a hero and whatnot, disabling devices that destroy planets' ecosystems. Now, the dude behind these devices was Mercurio, a space pirate warlord, a character that was normally a Thor villain. Venom was captured by one of his minions, a panda named Piccolo, who he was blackmailing, and was then separated from. Thompson. But it didn't turn out that well for the space pirate. Venom was actually tricking him in order to get information from him by bonding with him. After separating from him and returning to Thompson, he brutally beat down on Mercurio, to the point where Thompson had to stop him. Venom's initial instincts had become more increased since bonding with the space pirate made him excessively violent. And at number 4, Hawkeye. The 2015 Secret Wars story arc explores the Marvel Universe, Earth 616, combining with other various alternate universes, including one in which 2006's Civil War, the comic that the MCU film Captain America Civil War is loosely based off of, was never actually concluded. Now, in this alternate universe in Secret Wars Civil War issue 3, Matt copy the powers of what it has witnessed. So, all in all, not a fun time for our heroes. And at number 2, Punisher. <sighs> Gotta love a what if imprint. Last time on our part 1 list, we actually talked about two characters donning the Venom symbiote in a particular Marvel what if issue. Venom had managed to find his way to the Hulk, making Bruce Banner his host, and then later jumped ship onto the Asgardian god of thunder, Thor. But for this number, we're taking a look at a different what if title. What if Venom had possessed the Punisher? From 1992. Now, it had a similar story as the Hulks and Thors. What if, after Spider Man had gotten rid of his sentient alien black costume, instead of bonding with Eddie Brock, it bonded with Frank Castle instead? Punisher Venom, after realizing that he could manipulate the symbiote webbing into bullets to fire at his enemies, goes on a bit of a rampage and kills Microchip, Tombstone, and later Kingpin. He is eventually stopped by Spider Man, Daredevil, and Moon Knight, with Spidey busting out a sonic blaster that he scored from the Fantastic Four. But when he shoots it at Punisher Venom, it's too late. Venom has fully bonded with Castle. But the 
glasses enough for Castle to regain control of his mind and confront Venom, eventually succeeding by threatening to kill them both if Venom didn't cooperate with him. Venom gets to partake in Frank's kills and in exchange just behaves. Castle then tells Spidey that he's tamed the symbiote with the intention of using him as an instrument of vengeance. Hopefully that went well for him. And finally, in our number 1 spot, X-23. Life ain't too bad for Laura Kinney these days. After having a wildly successful cinematic debut in Logan back in 2017, and just recently finishing a run in her own comic that she was headlining in the form of all new Wolverine in the all new all different Marvel relaunch, she's got some pretty cool stuff going for her. She also bonded with Venom, which is pretty rad. Or at least for us readers. This happened in the Edge of Venomverse. Laura's Wolverine got a new detail added to her origin story. Now, for those unfamiliar with the character, she's the clone of Wolverine, later becoming his adopted daughter. And after breaking out of the test facility where she was created and experimented on, she would later attend school at the X Mansion and become a member of the X Force. She basically has all of Daddy Dearest's abilities, except her entire skeleton was infused with adamantium before she managed to escape. Now, in Edge of Venomverse issue 1, in an attempt to escape from her captors, she gets cornered and gassed with the only way out being to smash her way through a glass containment cell. And guess who's inside that containment cell? Venom, feeling her hate and rage bonds with her, and results in her kicking some major butts. She ends up escaping, living a fairly solitary life with Venom, who she manages to control quite well, until she encounters a gang of kids, and ends up sharing the symbiote with them. She's eventually pulled out of her reality and into the Venomverse reality to help fight their war. Starting us off in at number 10, X-23 from the Venomverse. We're going to begin our list with a handful of Venom alternates that initially appeared in the Venomverse story arc, starting off with Laura Kinney of Earth 24398, an alternate of Kinney who, much like her 616 counterpart, is a clone of Wolverine, created and raised in a facility to be an assassin. While there, she had attempted to break out four times, and on the fifth try, while cornered in the laboratory, she punctured a tank by accident with her claws. Inside of that tank was the Venom symbiote, who then broke free and bonded to Laura. Now equipped with all of Venom's powers, she managed to escape the facility for good making her way over to New York City where she would help and befriend the Runaways before being drawn to the events of Venomverse and teleported to a different reality. While she might not be a terrifying host when bonded with Venom, X-23 is by far one of the scariest looking alternate versions out there. Speaking of characters with adamantium claws, that brings us to our number 9 spot, Wolverine Venom. Another Venomverse character. This Venomized Wolverine, who first appeared in Edge of Venomverse in issue 4 in 2017, is from Earth 17673. He has the same history as another alternate version of Wolverine, known as Old Man Logan, who hails from Earth 807128. Diverting from that history when Logan told Bruce Banner Jr. the truth about his parentage, causing Banner Jr. to beat Logan to a pulp. Now for context, in Old Man Logan, after killing the Hulk, Logan takes Bruce Banner Jr. in, raising him as his own. Now on this Venomized Logan, Earth, he tells Bruce Jr. the truth about that, Bruce loses it, and then teams up with Archangel and Ashley Barton to kill Logan. The venomized T-Rex from Old Man Logan makes an appearance during this conflict and eats Wolverine, only for the Venom symbiote to jump ship from the dinosaur and bond with Wolverine instead. With his newfound powers, Venom Logan kills Archangel and Barton, but can't bring himself to kill Bruce Jr., despite the symbiote goading him on. The character was seemingly killed off in the Venomverse event during the story arc's climax. Moving on to number 8, Deadpool Venom. Last Venomverse character on our list, people, we promise. We can't help it that they're so awesomely terrifying. Wade Wilson of Earth 41715 is a version of Deadpool who has been bonded to the Venom symbiote. Ah, insanity and a hunger for human brains. What a combo. Before Venomverse, Wade was contracted to investigate a scientist named Dr. Scott, who was working on creating bioweapons and synthetic organs using a newly discovered species of prehistoric tapeworm. Upon looking into it, though, Wade would learn that the tapeworms were sentient, possessing a hive mind, and had taken over the bodies of not only Dr. Scott, but the other scientists in the lab, too. Lucky enough, the lab was also home to the Venom symbiote in this universe. Deadpool, who had bonded with the symbiote in the past, released it and then bonded with it again in order to expel the tapeworms from his own body, as well as killing the possessed scientists. Going by the name of Venom Pool, Wade used the symbiote to get rid of all the parasitic organs and tapeworms at a nearby hospital. I guess Venom Pool is all bark, no bite when it comes to the scary category? I mean, unless you're on the other end of it and he's whooping your butt, in which case, probably terrifying. Up next, number 7, Magic Venom. 
Magic Venom is a fun one. In 2019, after parting ways with Venom during Volume 4 of the Symbiote's self-titled series, Eddie Brock and his son Dylan, who didn't realize he was his son at the time, find themselves in the middle of a dark elf invasion of Earth in a crossover called War of the Realms. It was a big story event. In trying to protect Dylan, Eddie starts fighting off dark elves with his bare fists. No superpowers. No venom. This attracts the attention of one of Malkith's war witches, who offers Eddie something called a dream stone. This stone brings one's dreams and desires to life. So Eddie takes it and with it creates an artificial symbiote, which has become known as magic venom. It's taller, thinner, and more ghoulish than the regular venom, covering Eddie in spikes and giving him razor sharp claws. It's also a murderous creature, so there's that. Up next, number six, Edwin Brock. Coming from Earth 311, Edwin Brock is the Eddie Brock of Marvel 1602, an alternate reality set in the year of 1602, during the very end of the Elizabethan era. Brock appears in 1602 Witch Hunter Angela, and in which he lives on the outskirts of York as an apprentice to the town's printer. Get it? Because it's like journalism. Edwin made a deal with the Enchantress in order to enchant Anne Weying, the town's most beautiful woman, and get her to marry him. Sneaky, sneaky. But when Angela the Witch Hunter found out about this, she tried to stop him, and in the process, Edwin transformed into this alternate version of Venom, a monstrous creature with a ravenous hunger for flesh. Up next, number five, Venom 2099. Not to be mistaken with the Venom of Spider-Man 2099, more on that one later, this Venom is Aaliyah Bell a character from Earth TRN-767 who first appeared in Venom 2099 issue 1 in February of 2020. Pretty recent. Having been badly burned in an incident that also took her mother's life, Aaliyah has scars all over her left arm that made her a target for bullying in school. As a teenager, she underwent an experimental treatment to remedy her condition, and during the process, witnessed visions of an ancient dark god bonded to a creature of living darkness. Wonder where that sounds familiar, it's no. Once she awoke, the treatment worked, but turns out it had some side effects. She began turning into Venom. She would discover that the treatment had bonded her with a piece of the Venom symbiote, with the corporation behind the treatment, Alchemax, planning on using Aaliyah as a super soldier. Empathizing with Venom's situation and his desire to be made whole once more, she broke into Alchemax and reunited Venom with the rest of himself. Venom then agreed to not eat anyone if Aaliyah continued to be his host. Aw, how sweet. He's like, ah, oh, another person who's down for heroics. Guess I won't be eating those brains back on the chocolate. If you have no idea what that means, you should probably check out one of our other Venom top 10 lists. We talk about the brains a lot, like actual human brains. Get your mind out of the gutter. And at number four, Cron Stone. Spider-Man 2099 takes place in the alternate universe of Earth 928. It's a future reality. And in it, Spider-Man is Miguel O'Hara, who has an older half-brother by the name of Cron Stone. Now, Cron has had a rough life. He was constantly abused as a child by an android housekeeper, no less, who thought he was a dog. That sucks. This caused him to become a bully himself. A sadist, he constantly tormented Miguel to the point where the latter tried to kill Stone. That's intense. When we first meet the character, Stone is the one who gives orders to have the 2099 version of the Punisher, Jake Gallows, and his family killed. In retaliation, Gallows stabs Stone, fatally wounding him, and then dumps his body into a sewer. This is where Kron meets the Venom symbiote. As he lays dying, a black ball bumps into him. It bonds itself to him, creating Venom. And he ain't easy on the eyes, people, that's for sure. He's mutated over the years, now having acidic blood and saliva, and goes on a rampage to torment Miguel by hurting or straight up murdering those close to him. Moving on to number three, the ultimate Venom. Hailing from Earth 1610, Ultimate Venom from the Ultimate Universe first hit the scene in Ultimate Spider-Man issue 33. It's a lot of Ultimate. Initially, his design, according to co-creator and artist Mark Bagley, was meant to be more monster than supervillain, making him a, I quote, huge cancerous, tumorous creature. I mean, I think they succeeded. Because monster he is. Ultimate Venom differs quite a bit from his 616 counterpart. For starters, he's not an alien symbiote. Instead, he's the second stage of a genetically created suit designed by Peter Parker's father and Eddie Brock Sr. Peter and Eddie Brock Jr. are pals. Now, the suit is supposed to cure severe diseases because it bonds itself to the user and protects them from both internal and external harm, tailored to a specific individual's DNA. Here's where things get a little eerie. Since each suit is individualized, if someone puts on the suit who isn't meant to wear it, the suit will constantly harm them and require that they need a source of nourishment consistently. And that nourishment? 
organic flesh, people. After an accident, Venom would briefly bond with Peter, who would break free of the suit. Peter would then reveal his identity to Eddie Jr., who, embittered, would go to the lab and make and take another sample of the Venom suit, bonding it to himself. He would then immediately murder a janitor, and unable to control the suit, he was fully consumed by it, becoming ravenous and chaotic. Up next at number two, Venomized Galactus. Venom plus Galactus. Yeah, that's utterly horrific if you ask us. This combination takes a cosmic entity who literally devours planets for sustenance and combines that immense power with a symbiote who's known to be lethal, has a history of committing genocide, likes to eat brains, as we mentioned earlier, made Mac Gargan a cannibal, and gave birth to a homicidal psychotic symbiote who terrorized New York multiple times. So yeah, you can see why this venomized Galactus was a complete nightmare for Peter Parker when he first laid eyes on it in Web of Spider-Man issue 90. Luckily, this was just an illusion created by Mysterio, but nonetheless, an incredibly scary one. Also, good on you, Mysterio. That's actually very creative and scary. And last but not least in our number one spot, the T-Rex Venom. Yes, this is a Tyrannosaurus Rex that has been bonded with the Venom symbiote. And yes, it is a terrifying combination. This alternate version of Venom from Earth 807128 is commonly referred to as the Venomsaurus Rex. It appears in the Savage Land in Old Man Logan, and of course tries to kill Logan and an elderly blind Hawkeye. Turns out it wasn't just attacking them for the sake of wanting to spice up its life. Venomsaurus Rex's past was explored further in Old Man Hawkeye in which it was revealed that Venom had bonded with a clone of Jamie Maddox, aka Multiple Man, creating an army of Venoms. Venom had beef with Barden, who lures the Venom army out into the desert, where he knows there is a few dinosaurs kicking around, including T-Rexes. This works out for him, with the T-Rex attacking Venom and Hawkeye driving off as the prehistoric beast chomps down on Venom's body. Clearly, by the time Old Man Logan happens, Venom has decided to bond with the T-Rex, seeing it as a fitting host, and decides to take his revenge on Hawkeye and consequently Logan in the process.